we're just not done sequencing all of that, but there will be many weeks, so you will be able to see that. But today I'm going to be talking about the influence of anthropogenic and climactic forcing on water quality within a tropical coastal ecosystem, and that tropical coastal ecosystem is Heiia Fish Pond. Um, and this project is really, really close to my heart, and I wanted to quote um, Anolelo no Eao, which is a wise saying um, by Pukui, Ke ho'i ho'i ke ehu me ke moila. And it, the literal translation is, that which returns to the boiling sea um, like a moi fish. And the interpretation is, it's said of one who leaves home for a better chance of self-advancement, but eventually comes back. And I really see that as myself. Um, and um, when I came back, it was very important, being part of the Sea Grant Cluster Hire, to come up with some projects that um, had very close community ties. And so I really want to I'm also going to do this a little backwards. I'm going to give all my thank yous and acknowledgments first. So I really have to acknowledge Pai Pai o Heia, who are the cultural stewards of Heia Fish Pond, and in particular, I'm um, the executive director and the assistant executive director, Heile Cavello and Kili Ikotupete. Without them, they are like super critical um, stakeholders to this project. And of course, um, Sea Grant, because I'm part of the Coastal Sustainability Hire, and also Sea Grant has been the only people who have been funding this project, which was done on a, on a shoestring plus my startup fund. So this is a very dear project to my heart. Okay, I also want to acknowledge all of the collaborators who work on this, because Heia Ahupua'a, the watershed, <coughs> is actually a very rich um, research environment. It has a huge number of researchers. I'm not even including most of the fact that um, Coconut Island, the whole HIMB, is located within the confines of um, Heia. But I want to acknowledge in particular the Heia Coastal Ocean Observation System. This is our website. You can check us out on nakilohonuaoheia.org. And it's a, it's a hui. It's a group of researchers um, primarily, actually wholly, in the Department of Oceanography, um, composed with Kathleen Ruttenberg, Margaret McManus, um, Kiana Frank, Ryan Glazer. And these are also many of the students whose data that you will see today. Um, Becky Briggs, who just recently left, but she, many of you know her because she was the manager of the S Lab. Um, Chip Young, Danielle Hall, Amanda Timmerman, and Danny McCoy. I also want to acknowledge the other PIs um, who have really been instrumental in kind of creating um, and sustaining the research there Judy Lemus, um, Megan Donahue, Flo Thomas, and Henrietta um, for a lot of really great conversation and thinking about what's going on in the fish pond. And I really, really need to acknowledge my lab because so much of this data that you're going to see was collected by um, the people that, in this image. And a lot of the data you're present, I'm presenting today, and all of the data, I really have to say, um, this is really the first PI-like type talk where I haven't generated most of the data. Most of this data has been generated by these three women here. Um, Camila Toniakini, who's a GES undergrad, Michaela Branco, who is a microbiology undergrad, and Kiana Frank, who is a SOAS Young investigator affiliated with my group. And so um, it has been such a tremendous um, and awesome experience to work with all of them. All right, so today I'm going to talk about what the main <coughs> research goals are in this coastal environment. First, it's to establish a baseline for land use change. The second is to understand the impact of episodic events and specifically storms in this environment. And then to ask if we could look much more long term to determine the effects of climate change. I actually ended up ditching this because I realized I wanted to have time for questions. So I have that data at the very end. Um, if anybody wants me to go into that. And, and I'm going to provide an example kind of linking the impact of episodic events with transforming research into stewardship, particularly for Pai Pai o Heia. So Heia Ahupua'a I think is an ideal watershed because it really provides the ability to survey um, from ridge to reef the different impacts. And a lot of that has to do with the way that the land ownership was set up. <coughs> that it was originally completely owned by Kamehameha Schools Bishop Estate. And so you really have this really nice land unit that has been preserved. Pieces of it have been sold off, but you have this ability um, to really capture in time and space um, a lot of different gradients. So this is where it's located. It's kind of located down in the lower quadrant of Kaneohe Bay. Um, <clears throat> and in this area, you have a lot of different kind of inputs. So into this area, you have Heia Stream. There are three kind of inputs into the bay. You have a lot of impacts of terrestrial, both you know, people-wise as well as you know, riverine input-wise. You also have a lot of climactic forcing events. Again, I said the stream, how that changes with storms, wind, rain, and you know, the input 
from the ocean to back to the, to the land and from the land into the ocean. So how do we begin to think about constraining these inputs? What's really great about this is that, well, it's pretty hard to constrain inputs in a situation like this, but something like a fish pond is really nice because when you have this kind of walled system, it provides a mesocosm type system where, whereby if you can kind of calculate these measured you know, inputs and outputs into each individual um, opening, and you can calculate the volume and the bathymetry, then you can really begin to construct things like a nutrient budget. And that then allows you to have a framework for then if stuff happens, like uh, restoration or <coughs> development or a large storm comes in, it really allows a much more constrained area for you to begin to ask questions. And also in this kind of constrained area, you can do much better uh, controlled experiments. <clears throat> so to give you perspective on the kinds of anthropological input into Heia, um, just give you a broad timeline. Take us all the way back to 1215, which we think is, we, we believe Heia fish pond to be at least 800 years old. So that's like where this number comes from. So Hawaiian aquaculture in Heia Ahupua'a was really established back in the 1200s. And we think from that until, until about 1789, you had this really nice, um, intensive on the land and maybe more extensive on this coastal area linked um, aquaculture and agricultural system of the flooded ecosystem territory. And you have a lot of lo'i up until this point. Okay, and so this is just a de classic depiction of an ahupua'a where you can see very, very efficient land use. You have you know, the stream, which is a managed stream. You never completely divert all the water. It then returns back. And the system known as kanavai, which still exists today of Hawaiian land use and water. <coughs> um, then in starting kind of post-contact um, with Western, co you know, constant post-contact with Western uh, society, you have more of a, the introduction of a plantation style agriculture. You have everything from sugar to pineapple being experimentally um, done up upland. And then of course, what are the downstream impacts? All of that can be recorded kind of and looked at in the lens of this area, this fish pond. And this is an image from 1910. Of course, mangrove was planted in the area in 1920 and became a major, major problem. And then of course, that area, Malka, or um, upstream of the fish pond, uh, became developed um, for housing and um, a lot of other purposes along the side. So you can kind of also c contrast how dark the fish pond looked um, in 1928 versus this is really a sedimented kind of muddy bottom. It was originally built atop a coral reef and kind of enclosed um, a coral reef. So it was quite a shallow bottom and now you can see it's quite sedimented, the result of urbanization. In 1965, an extremely devastating um, Keapuka flood um, came through and just busted open, um, broke several walls and the force of the water coming down the stream broke not only the wall over here, the internal wall, but broke through this external wall and that forever changed the circulation and flow within the fish pond. Um, and then of course in 2001 to 2015 we have Pai Pai Ohe'ia coming in. In 2003 they really assumed the lease for this fish pond and have been restoring the wall by rebuilding and removing mangrove and I don't know how many of you guys went but um, I know Kian and I definitely went to the final rebuilding of that portion of the wall that was busted open by the Kampuka flood um, this past December, and it was just tremendously amazing to see 2,000 people standing on this wall passing rocks to fill in that puka. And so it continues today. And so you can see all of that can be captured in this one small ecosystem. <clears throat> And to kind of just summarize, again, I love these pictures contrasting. This time, it's not just the fish pond. It's, you can see at Malka that this was, this is, a, this, these are plantations. And you can see this is the Heia stream that was also diverted into Awai, or irrigation ditches, um, to irrigate these um, areas down here. And there's also a lot of um, natural springs in this area that fed um, all of the crops. And you can see that now it's pretty much a grassy area. It hasn't, it hasn't been fully restored back to agriculture or back to lo'i or taro. And so that really changes the chemistry of the water that eventually makes its way into Heia fish pond. So in general, to summarize, Heia fish pond is affected by runoff sedimentation, different effects of nutrient inputs, and of course, storm surges and major floods. 
So if you haven't been introduced to it, this, this is the coastal ocean, Hi'ia Coastal Ocean Observing System. It's an eight year time series. I've only been at UH for two and a half years. So this was established by Kathleen Ruttenberg. And um, then, you know, of course, Marker Mechanics collaborated, Brian Glazer, and then of course, Kiana and I have um, added our, our um, expertise to this. But you should really think of this as really an amazing feat. This is likely the most instrumented fish pond, definitely in the Hawaiian Islands and therefore probably the world. Um, we have both in-grid, in the pond, as well as Makaha location sites. If you've ever been to Hei'ia Fish Pond and you see these white PVC pipes sticking up, those are our sampling sites. Okay, so the river comes in and there are three Makaha. Those are the inputs. We sample all along those. We sample along every input and output of the fish pond. And then we also established a grid, um, a sampling grid, which enables really, really high resolution sampling. And um, the Hei'ia Coastal Ocean Observation System has sampled pretty much monthly um, for the last eight years there. So we have a huge um, set of physical and geochemical data. So just to kind of give you an even more, like what is really there, we have pressure sensors as well as current meters. Those are marked by the uh, magenta boxes. We also had do discrete water samples as well as live side drops at all of these. So you can see it's really, really high coverage as far as the density and the capacity for data collection. So what do we know having all of this heavy, heavy instrumentation in place? There is a lot known about the physical and the geochemical, as I said. So we're, we, we have a pretty good idea of the flow, the depth, the effect of wind and the temperature. Um, and because of our monthly grabs, we have an idea of nutrient levels, the NTP ratios, oxygen, and salinity. What we have very much less limited knowledge of is the biological, which to me, because I'm a microbiologist and biologist, is really the much more interesting kind of component because I think it drives and definitely connects uh, the physical and the geochemical sides of it. There have been past studies primarily on the macroalgae. Those studies were done by Jenny Murphy, um, Megzi, I uh, can't remember her last name. She was a grad student, uh, a master's student with Megan Donahue, um, Cheryl Leon Soon, who's soon to be finishing her PhD in Flo Thomas's lab, and then some biochemical activity done by Danielle for her GES undergrad. <coughs> but it's really kind of limited to this. So we don't have a good idea, for example, of what's going on with the microbes. And as we know, microbes drive many biogeochemical processes. And so that was the motivation for getting involved um, with this group was because I thought, wow, it just fits really well is to provide this complementary piece of knowledge that can help us to figure out what are the drivers and the influences that are going on in this fish pond. So to provide you with some of the back information, the actual details on what we know physically and um, biogeochemically, um, <clears throat> we actually know the fish pond bathymetry. And I, I love showing this graph. This, the pond bathymetry was done by Sarah Vasconcelos, who has just come back to do her PhD with um, Sylvia Smith in botany. She, you see these grid maps. This is what she did. She rode around on a surfboard with a GPS and a stick and measured the entire pond. And that's why it's such high resolution is because she physically rode around on a boogie board, or sorry, an actual surfboard of doing this measurement. And that's how we then modeled and developed how we know how deep the fish pond is. And so you can see that um, it varies according to the tide. So on the spring tide, um, at, the, at flood, it's uh, 300,000 square meters. And on the ebb, it's about 93. So hmm. you can see there's a high, high amount of flux, <coughs> which is tidally influenced. And then as far as I was speaking to the inputs and outputs, these are all the makaha flux into and out of the pond and work by Margaret McManus's uh, GES undergrads, including um, mostly done by Brian D'Andrea, who did all of the rating curves so that we know exactly what the volume is and how much the pressure is and going in and out of the pond at any time. And now, we, because he's done such wonderful rating curves, we can just use pressure sensors which are much cheaper and allow us at any point in time to say, okay, the pressure is this much, that tells us what, you know, high tide, low tide, and what's going on in the pond. There are also extreme flow areas, or were, with the ocean break, and so that's one reason why we always have to keep studying Hei'ia Fish Pond because um, restoration occurs, and so this no longer exists, but I wanted to show it because it's so dramatic. So at low tide, there used to be this elbow, um, kind of wall that was kind of stacked cylinder, um, cylinder um, concrete cylinders. So you, it was a huge break. It was about 100 yards across. And they, you would cross it in this little elbow break. 
it was these stacked things. So at low tide you could cross, but the tide would rise and then it was just slippery going and like be super careful. And I remember one time when I first went to Heia Fish Pond, they were telling me, oh yeah, we just got like a baby hammerhead shark just slipped over during high tide and is like swimming around in the pond. And it stayed there for a number of months and then left on the next high tide and never seen them since. So um, definitely, the, at least the macrofauna is dramatically affected by these extreme differences in flow. <clears throat> and so some of the amazing data that was put together is that, again, this is all HECOS data, is that we can determine because we know the rating curves and we've studied it and we know that the volume changes dramatically, we can then determine the relative magnitude of the flow rate per tidal cycle. So then, of course, knowing all of this and then also knowing what the nutrient concentration is, that gives us an idea of both residence time as well as building a nutrient budget. So this is pretty dramatic. You might expect that the ocean break would have had the highest amount of difference in flow, but actually it's one of the, it's this other makaha just a little bit farther up the wall that has the, that is responsible for the highest flow. But one thing that I also want to show you, which will be relevant for later, is if you look at the ebb flow, it actually flows out the river Makaha. So normally, all of the things that flow in, you can see it still flows in at uh, high tide versus low tide, but maybe the magnitude, actually this is exactly the same. In this area, when it flows out, when water exits the pond, it kind of flows out this way. And so you can imagine that you might have some donating <coughs> going around in this, in this region because water can go out and maybe some can come back in. And that will be important for later study that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> so that is the area of highest flow. And of course, this makaha down here is the area of the very lowest flow. And so, for example, one way that we can inform stewardship and management would be to say, well, perhaps you might want to put another makaha here. That would increase your flow because um, this was actually the site of a really dramatic and terrible fish kill event that happened in 2009 at the last, during the last El Nino. And it happened when the fish were penned in this area, likely because of poor circulation that facilitated um, temperature stratification and then like no oxygen. So they got cooked and they couldn't breathe. Okay, so to summarize, the thing that you would think would contribute the most only contributes about 12% of the flow. Um, even though it's only 12%, that's 26,000 square meters that exits and enters um, that ocean break every day, which no longer does. And so I'm actually meeting with Pai Pai Ohei on Monday to discuss redoing some of these analyses because they really want to know, now that we've repaired the break, is our pond more salty? Is it less salty? Um, because that really, really influences um, how uh, macroalgae grows and subsequently how the fish that they want to um, grow up to eat will grow. And so basically previous to, to December, it was approximately 6 million gallons per tidal cycle that was exchanged over ocean break. And that was only 12% of the flow. So that always like blows my mind. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things that we can do is then, is because we have such a great sampling grid, is to kind of create a broad portrait of what's going on across the pond. And the reason why I featured this gentleman here, Danny McCoy, is because he is extremely good at programming in MATLAB. And he sucked in all of our Excel spreadsheets with our data and the GPS points of our sampling grid and was able to spit out at us these wonderful contour plots of what was going on in a snapshot at the pond. Um, and he is now a technician for the HOT program on the physical oceanography side. So he continues to be um, really awesome in that respect. But this is just an example now. So we know that this is the riverine inputs. Um, and we can see then, if we look at the pond, where is it the most turbid? And so you can see, OK, there's high turbidity coming in at this river Makaha. But it's also interesting because we have high turbidity down here. What might that be? Well, it turns out that's the boat dock where um, Pai Pai Ohe'ia does most of their activities. And so perhaps on this particular day, there was a lot of turbidity because maybe there were some community activities down on this side of the pond. And then it happens to be less so, potentially because of great flushing with the ocean. So if we look at general water quality trends, then we can look at what does the pond look like for temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. And for this particular data set, we can see that <coughs> as far as temperature, um, it's, it's a little bit on the warm side. I mean, you can see that it's cool where the river water comes in. That makes sense. The fresh water is a lot cooler um, than the bay water. But it's not as hot as back here, potentially, which would be indicative also of um, circulation patterns. And we look at salinity, you can really see that for the most part, the pond is quite saline. 
right? It's right up there with just regular seawater, except in this river, this riverine Makaha area. And so you might ask, why aren't these um, inputs not contributing more fresh water? And the answer is because this is also where the Keapuka flood broke the fish pond wall. And so now you have a diffuse flow region and you don't have a lot of just nice water coming into the pond in these areas. And so that's a region I think where Pai Pai is focusing their next restoration efforts is to not only continue with mangrove removal up in the stream area, but to rebuild this wall and rebuild these makaha so that more fresh water can come into the pond. And then when we look at dissolved oxygen, you can see that the riverine inputs have lower dissolved oxygen um, than this area. Um, but in general, you know, it's a pretty, pretty good dissolved oxygen. Again, this is all at the surface. This isn't um, at the bottom in the benthos. So one of the things that Chip Young did was he kind of aggregated to look at what kind of ecological niches has the pond have now. This might not be the ideal situation. This might not necessarily represent a healthy fish pond, but this is where the fish pond is at now, is that it seems like we have some freshwater input areas there might be some distinct ecological um, niches representing terraginous, maybe extremely sedimented areas. And then it seems like there's kind of two different kinds of ocean. The, the water that comes in here is a little bit different from the water that comes in here. That may be partially influenced by, you know, the fact that it comes in from the stream and, you know, hangs out in this area. And then there seems to be a mid-pond profile. And so one question that um, Kiana and I both had when we began to think about this project is, okay, so it seems that the biogeochemical and the physical data are telling us that there are these niches. Um, could this be constraining the microbes? Like, is this an actual, are these actual different habitats? Um, and what might be some of the physical and geochemical properties constraining them, if any, and how do these communities potentially respond to a perturbation like a storm? I'm going to tell you I can't answer all of these questions today, but I will tell you some stories <coughs> near to answering them. So when we first began, we said, okay, what do we know is there? The answer was not much. So again, Sarah Vasconcelos, that great student, she did some EM, just actually, these are the only EM she did, of some sediment that was in the pond. And she did say, okay, there's some diatoms and cyanobacteria. And that was it. That was basically pretty much all we knew. Um, we had done some studies on um, chlorophyll so we knew something about the photosynthetic potential of the pond, but we didn't have a really good feeling for the kinds of organisms that were in that pond. So of course our question was, who else was there and what are they doing? What you need to know is potentially, how does this food web work? And so the way that the local uh, food web is set up is that it's really meant to be, like I said, Aquaculture in Hawaii was meant to be extensive, not intensive, the way that much aquaculture is, you know, like for example in Asia. The goal is not to input any additional nutrients in. You just use natural nutrients that are coming in from the riverine inputs to make primary producers. So the goal of fish ponds was not to make fish, it was to make macroalgae or, or primary producers, even like maybe microalgae, maybe some diatoms and stuff, that would then grow fish because really the, the consumers that were in this fish pond were herbivorous. That was like a fact. I don't know if any of you guys know that, but fish ponds in Hawaii did not grow regular carnivorous fish. They grew herbivores. So that was, that's, that's the way that the cycle ideally worked. Of course, in the fish pond today, it's an unknown question. So, you know, in the fish pond today, you might have, um, and it's also shallow. So that also kind of helps to promote this whole photosynthetic kind of sea meadow with lots of different organisms. You have nutrients now, maybe the nutrient balance is off. You know, in terms of the photosynthetic, we don't know, we have a lot of invasive algae. What are the different processes that they're doing to draw down these nutrients and how does that ultimately impact some of the grazers that we can't see in the fish pond? And then of course, how does that impact the fish? And of course I wanna give Kiana credit because she has mad PowerPoint skills and I could never have drawn this. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to give you an idea of the, the study that I'm gonna tell you about, I wanna give you an idea of what the pond looks like. So we're looking at that far upper corner of the fish pond, this is a drone. So you can actually see, you might see like, why is it shallow, why isn't there water here? So that's because the strategy that Pai Pai Ohe'ia has used to um, deal with the mangrove is they don't dig it up. They just cut the mangrove off at the water line. And so that whole root mass, that whole root mass is just decaying in the pond. And we've actually done modeling studies. And if 
<clears throat> pipi never does anything. The natural circulation processes will eventually, maybe in the next 30 years or so, that was the estimates of, it will take about 30 years for all of this accumulated root mass to eventually cycle out of the pond. That's not taking into account you know, major perturbations. It's just the natural decomposition rate, um, you know, sediment transport rates, it's not a very exact model. All to say that this is the area that I'm now going to tell you about where we've done um, some more in-depth studies. Okay, so we did a really in-depth study from June 2010 to about August um, 15th, sorry, June 10th through August 15th, 2014, so about two summers, one and a half summers ago. Um, we, we were able to deploy um, some really, really awesome instruments and um, take constant measurements in the pond. Um, these, para these are the following parameters that we looked at. We looked at wind. This data actually comes from um, Mokuolo'e, which is Coconut Island. Um, the tide, uh, th these rain gauges come from in the Ahupua'a. Actually, the rain gauge comes from Luluku. He the Heia stream comes from gauges in Heia stream. Um, our deployment was able to capture temperature, salinity, turbidity, and currents. Um, and the first thing that you can see, because it's a whole lot of data, is something interesting happened here. Okay, so I will tell you about that. I'm also going to tell you about how we divided this summer up because some really interesting stuff happened. For example, when you see something interesting happen here, you might also notice that the salinity dropped. I'm going to go into more detail. And then you can also see that, wow, after the salinity dropped, before the turbidity was a little bit stable, and you can now see that there's these little pulses of disturbances of the turbidity after that. This um, study was really carried out by Camilla Tonyakini as part of her e uh, GES undergraduate thesis. So um, what I'm going to talk about is what are the different things that happen to this physical environment. This, this is deployed in that top corner of the fish pond. So <clears throat> we deploy the instruments in, on, around June 10th, and we <coughs> called this week beforehand baseline or background. And the reason why we deployed it is because we originally wanted to study what were the effects on these parameters when we removed the mangrove in these areas, when we removed the last stand of mangrove that was in that in that top west corner. And we thought one of the major things that might happen would be an increase in circulation, maybe there would be a difference in turbidity. Unfortunately, um, due to just scheduling problems, we ended up leaving our instruments there much longer. And that was very fortuitous because it enabled us to capture three storm events. So we captured storm, tropical storm Wally, which is, was actually one of the biggest tropical storms we've had on Oahu in many, many years. And then we captured back-to-back -back hurricanes, Hurricane Isel and Hurricane Julio. Um, and so just to kind of give you a summary, um, Wally was really um, characterized by being a major rain event uh, on, in this Ahupua'a. Um, Isel didn't bring so much rain, as you can see, really like no, no rain and no response from the stream, but it was a major wind event. And then um, Julio was a major heat event. And so I'm going to go through those and kind of explain what happened um, in those scenarios. One of the things you have to know in this area is what did the daily tidal cycle look? So remember I said that in that corner, when we looked at the difference in the tides, you could see that the vector flow would change, particularly with that one makaha, and that sometimes with circulation, you might get some donating. So one thing you can see then is uh, the currents, they shift during the flood tide. So you normally have it going, I'm trying to remember, I think up is north, and then it shifts to the southwest during the flood, and then it shifts back. Okay, and so you, in, during the pressure, you can also see that it's an asynchronous tidal cycle. So you have, this is the high tide and then the semi-low tide. When, what I mean by asynchronous is that it's not completely, it's not a perfect, um, it's not perfectly symmetrical. And that may also have to do with the fact that you have like a fish pond, which is kind of like a bowl, so it can fill up rather quickly. But then because of the, um, that elbow wall, the tide um, leaves slower than it can enter in. So the flow fast, occurs faster than the ebb. You can see that in the, just the profile of how it looks. Um, we can also see some temperature or some diel solar warming. So it gets um, cooler and then warmer and then cooler and warmer. And of course the salinity changes due to the high tide and the turbidity is also higher at the low tide. So this is what the daily tidal cycle looks like in that area. So you can see most of the time it's going in this direction, but then, soon I hope, we'll see it shift. So that's the flood, that's the tide going out. So most of the time it's coming in, 
most of the time it's coming in, but then most of the time it's going out. So these are the vectors. Calculate the strength of the vector till it gives you the strength.